Hi there everyone, I'm Matthew Needham and I'm here today with Michael Cook from Creation Ministries International and so we're going to be really delving into getting some answers today to solve some of the conundrums of the world and how to lead people into the truth of the gospel. But I'm going to begin with just asking Michael how you came to the Lord and just a little bit of background to who you are, where okay. you came from, and then how God called you to himself. Thank you, Matthew. It's a, a real blessing to be here with you. And um, to anyone watching this, I trust that what I say would be a blessing to you as, um, as I share from my heart, I guess. So, yeah, for me, I was brought up in a Christian home, originally from England, and we came out to New Zealand when I was about five years old and um, set up home in Nelson. That was my childhood home right through. And so we had um, mum and dad came into an amazing relationship with Jesus. And so they were very committed Christians. And we attended a little, a little Anglican church in Nelson. And I used to go to every boys rally, uh, which is in the Brethren Church in Nelson. And it was one uh, camp we actually had. We were sitting around the campfire, me as an 11 year old, and just a simple um, catching up with the the, the guys there, and one of our leaders, Mr. Gargiulio, he just gave a simple uh, gospel message and account and just said, if anyone would like to respond to Jesus, and I put my hand up. So I remember it was November 1972, as an 11 year old, is when I personally uh, understood that God was real, and I took on my own faith at that point. And then I went through, and um, through my teenage years, I obviously had ups and downs. Uh, I encountered evolutionary teaching at high school and really struggled with that whole thing about, you know, my teacher, whom I respected, was really convincing, but I also knew that God was real and what I was taught at uh, home and, and at school, uh, sorry, at uh, Sunday school and church, also made sense. So I was disconnected for a long time about sharing my faith uh, because I didn't actually know what I really believed and why. And it was later on when I was a young married man in Hamilton, we had a, a creation speaker came to our church and he gave a simple um, message, presentation of what we call a relevance talk about why we could actually understand our Christian faith in light of the Bible being true. And for me, I went, that makes sense. Something, you know, I'm one of these intellectual, uh, technical type persons. And for me, that made sense. And it started me on a journey of really just digging into what God's word says, but also looking at the world around me and thinking, yeah, what, which um, history makes the better sense? So it's taken years, many years, but um, I'm convinced of God's word being true. And I know from the spiritual transformation that I've experienced uh, through Jesus and seen in my own family um, that it is real, the gospel is real. Um, I haven't got all the answers, but like a jigsaw puzzle, we put all the pieces together. We have the, the board around the outside and large areas of the picture make sense. And for me, my Christian faith is like that. I see enough of God's working in my life and in uh, a rational sense to say it, it makes sense. It's the best worldview, it's convincing. I know God is real. Um, I haven't got all the answers, there's some, still some holes, um, but that's where God's taken me to. It's still a journey, I'm not there yet, um, but I know that he loves me and he's given me an identity and an amazing family. And so that's my journey really, just uh, from that 11 year old statement of faith to where I am now. So uh, now just going to ask for a bit of a history on this ministry that you're involved with now called Creation Ministries and just give us where did this ministry begin and how's it developed? Okay, good question, Matthew. So yeah, Creation Ministries, as we're known now, um, was founded in the late 1970s in Australia, in Queensland, actually. And there were three um, guys who got together and started what was called the Creation Science Foundation back in, in Brisbane in uh, about 1978. And Creation Magazine was also founded back in those days. And Creation Ministries has come through over those decades since. And now is um, we've got offices in seven different uh, countries and we've also got staff around the world. And so Creation Ministries came through that development um, of a ministry that's there to uphold the Word of God from the very first verse. So the main emphasis has been, we can obviously, we need to have a spiritual relationship with God, but God's Word is under attack. And so how do we connect this to the real world? And so uh, Henry M uh, Morris and John Whitcomb's 1961 book called The Genesis Flood was a, a really, um, milestone book in the, the world of Christian belief and it was from that that people started looking at the world around us does it make sense in the light of God's word what about the flood you know what about creation what about genetics how do we actually reconcile this with what we read in scripture and so 
in their other creation uh, type ministries around the world, again with a, a heart just to equip people to be um, have a rational faith. And so Creation Ministries has been around a long time. We became Creation Ministries as a name in about 2005, I think it was. Formerly we were Answers in Genesis. So Answers in Genesis, is, um, they're mainly focused in the States. So we're really sort of, in some ways, a parallel sister ministry, but completely disconnected organisationally. Um, but we have a lot of shared um, teaching and resources between us. So for me personally, it was at a, a camp in 1999, we had a creation camp in Taupo, and I went along to it. And uh, somebody said, "Oh, you're from Hamilton, are you? Oh, there's so and so here who's from Hamilton." And one by one, we got together and uh, formed a, a small, what we called then Answers in Genesis support group. And we were just a group of enthusiastic volunteers who would get together and support speaking ministry coming through, um, just to do some meetings together, uh, learn about creation together. And so that was officially founded as a support group. And then later on, we became uh, Hamilton Friends of CMI Group and we had a lovely retired uh, accountant John Thorpe he led our ministry for quite a few years uh, he was very organized which I'm not sometimes <laughs> but he was great but the Lord took him home suddenly in 2006 and so I sort of inherited the the role of leading the group um, it's gotten a little quiet in the last uh, two or three years but we've got a core of people who just um, are really faithful love the Lord love creation ministries uh, work and so they support me too in my local work in Hamilton and we're keen to get in, involved in other areas of outreach and ministry, maybe to um, market farmers markets or whatever, to get out and just to give people ideas of what to think about when we look at the world. We were so thankful to have you share at our church and just bring your message and I'd just like you just to give it, share a little bit of that message with those who are watching now. What are you trying to do and what is your message for the church? Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Again, it was a real privilege for Desmer and myself to come and, and speak at your church this morning. And it's my first um, event for quite a few months due to COVID and so on. But basically, the message I gave this morning is what we call a relevance talk. And so the idea is to, it's not a sermon, it's a, a message that's to equip people to start thinking about their own faith, why they believe what they do, what's the evidence for it, how do I defend my faith. And so it's called um, a Genesis Foundations for Good News. And it basically goes down the track of seeing that Genesis is a foundational book in the Bible. It's the first book of the Bible. But it contains a lot of history, right from creation, right through to the fall, and then through to the, the global flood, and then, of course, the dispersion of Babel. So there's a lot of history packed in there. But it's highly controversial, and a lot of people see Genesis as, well, as myth or written by a bunch of ignorant shepherds you know, in the ancient Near Eastern uh, lens. And so there's a lot of deconstruction of Genesis that goes on. So our focus as Creation Ministries is to people to take Genesis as Jesus did and all the New Testament writers did as well. That's to look at Genesis and go, okay, this is real history. It's talking about real people in a real point in time with real children doing real things. And there's chronologies giving the ages of all the patriarchs when they had each generation. So there's a lot of history contained within Genesis and a lot of doctrine too seeded within Genesis, the whole thing about we're created in God's image, we're given a stewardship mandate for the planet, we are fallen, we obviously need a saviour, we can't save ourselves, the whole thing about God's judgment in the flood, and of course why we have um, death, suffering and bloodshed in the world because of the fall, and uh, of course leading up to Jesus, why Jesus had to come and die a physical death to pay for physical sin, which came in with spiritual death as well at the same time when Adam and Eve sinned. So the whole thing is foundational to the whole gospel. And so our encouragement is really for people just to, to look at Genesis afresh as history, not as metaphor or myth or poetry, because it's clearly history and as Jesus took it to be. And so that's the idea of emphasising Genesis, but also, above all, emphasising the gospel that we have. You know, Honour Christ the Lord as holy, as it says in um, 1 Peter 3.15. But always be ready to give a, um, an answer for the hope that's within us, and always do it with gentleness and respect. No one wants a, you know, a Bible bashing legalist. And so we have to realise that we have a testimony, we have a, a rational faith and we to share it. So it's really an evangelical message, but it's based on the fact we can see the Bible and take it as God's truth, and it stacks up when we look at the real world. You made a lot of good points this morning, and one that 
some of them you just had to mention very briefly, but I thought it was quite good when you said that, you know, people who take in the book of Genesis, Abraham being a, a true, real person, and yet they would then jump and say that Adam and Eve were just myth. Why do you think that has happened when both of those stories are in the same book in the Bible? Well, that's a really good point. Why would people start to say that certain parts of the genealogy are myth and metaphor? Because, of course, Adam and Eve were pre the flood. So there's a lot of history between Abraham in Genesis 12 and, um, Gen Ab and Adam sorry, in Genesis chapter 1. And so there's a lot of events that happen that are quite controversial, including, or above all, the global flood that destroyed the whole earth. And so people start to say, well, whereabouts do we try to say that maybe this is poetry up to this point and the real people start? And so, yeah, the, the whole thing of trying to bring in outside ideas from outside scripture into scripture. And we see many attempts to try to reconcile what the world is saying, the naturalistic worldview of saying that the millions of years, there is no God, uh, everything happens slowly and gradually. So because people say, well, that must be credible, scientists have proven the millions of years and the fact that the Big Bang is true and so on. Therefore, we have to adapt scripture to try to fit. And so um, compromising the genealogies and saying that some people are metaphors and other people are real is part of that idea of trying to um, adjust scripture to fit within man's man-made ideas that are brought in outside scripture. One point I'd like to make is a lot of people say, well, you Christians, you disagree about modes of baptism or women in ministry or, uh, you know, um, di different ideas where we have healthy deb debates, I guess, about the interpretation of Scripture. I agree, but what that is, people are taking ideas from within Scripture and they all agree that Scripture is authoritative. So as people grapple with different ideas, then we can say we, we can disagree on our interpretation, but we agree that God's Word is real. When we try to compromise with Genesis especially, we're actually bringing ideas that are not scriptural into scripture, and that's the difference. And so I think a lot of attempts to try to compromise with scripture uh, aren't needed. We don't need to try to bend to the world's view. And as I mentioned in my talk, the, the whole thing of uh, science, we have operational science and then we have historical science. And so the argument is not over science versus faith, it's actually over which history best fits the evidence. And that's why I tried to explain this morning that we have the same fossils, we have the same rock layers, we have the same uh, animals, plants and people, but how we interpret that through the lens of history is where the difference is. And so, yeah, I think the genealogies are really important. That's where we get the, the relatively short time of the uh, history of the world from the Bible is through those chronologies. If you add up all the uh, ancestors going back to Adam, we end up with just a few thousand years back to creation. And that stacks up with what we see in science. So what is some of the scientific evidence that backs the Bible, and particularly how the, you're standing firm on the book of Genesis and the first few chapters? What are some of the scientific reasons to believe? OK, what are the reasons? Obviously, I can speak theologically and try to make arguments from scripture and so on but that's a really good point Matthew that we need to actually look at which of the areas of science and observation that we can look at in the present world today in front of us what makes the most sense um, and I think for me again this idea of the jigsaw puzzle we see stuff from geology we see things from biology we see it from archaeology all pointing to the fact that the Bible's account of history is real uh, for example geology I talked about the worldwide flood we talk about the flood, not just a tranquil you know, bathtub filling up and overflowing and draining away. We're talking about a huge catastrophic event that resurfaced the whole of the earth. What would, we, what, would we, sorry, what would we expect to see? We would expect to see huge amounts of um, sediment laid down, billions or trillions of dead things all buried uh, under layers, huge amounts of vegetation compressed and covered with sediment. What do we see? We see fossil, fossil graveyards all around the world. We see big bands of coal, we see things that have catastrophically occurred. And we see layers and layers of rock with no erosion between them. We see folded rocks, we see all sorts of issues that seem to have happened very catastrophically. That makes a lot of sense when we look at the uh, Bible's account of the flood. It doesn't make sense when you look at the very slow, gradual, grain by grain, storm by storm over millions of years. What about biology? We see 
what we see we know now from genetics that things seem to be decaying our genomes are becoming more and more mutated more and more damaged just as it says in scripture that you know all of creation groans you know we're we're decaying we're falling apart not just in our own bodies but the genome is is uh, devolving so to speak and we see we look at genetic lines we see um, the y chromosome is common to all men around the world and the uh, mitochondrial dna getting a bit technical here but it seems to go back to three main uh, ancestors in the women which seem to point to the three daughters daughters in law of noah so we see genetics and uh, geology pointing towards the bible being true and we just see it again the whole thing about evolution natural selection is not evolution so we see things like dog breeding for example you have an original wolf-like ancestor and you start to select for the largest um, puppy in the in the litter and you keep selecting for the traits you want you end up with something like a great dane or if you want a little toy dog that's uh, great to play with you'll keep selecting for small and cute small and cute until you end up with a little toy dog like a chihuahua but the key thing is you've seen a huge amount of variety come out expressed by these genes from the original mongrel-like ancestor but the key thing is see you've lost so many traits you cannot go back so no amount of breeding a chihuahua is going to give you a wolf or a, a great dane or vice versa same with plants as well why are they so desperately hanging on to um, ancestral kinds heritage kinds of fruit um, plants seeds and so on they're putting them into into seed banks and keep storing the genetic uh, diversity away because natural selection and artificial breeding selects away from pre-existing information until you've lost traits that you need elsewhere that points to creation god created the kinds each with a huge amount of variety able to adapt but what we've seen downhill is adaptation selection but a loss of function so speciation yes but one kind can never become a different kind so the change we see is the wrong way for evolution to have occurred so again the bible affirms natural selection and um, speciation but not evolution so what else would you say to a person who kind of says well yeah i, I god might be there but i, I still believe in evolution um, do they coexist do this, what's your view on that that's a good point isn't it so um, as i mentioned in the service this morning evolutionism and atheism are linked so as i made hopefully clear that all atheists must believe in evolution but can Christians believe in evolution? Yes, they can. And I want to emphasize again that if somebody's struggling with, are you saying that I'm not a believer? I'm not, I'm not a Christian because I believe in evolution. I'm not saying that. You know, we are saved by grace and by grace alone, not by works or what we believe. But I would respectfully um, say that when you say I believe in evolution or God used evolution to create, have a think about what that actually means, not just scientifically, uh, but scripturally. You know, to go down the track of God using a process that took millions of years, the whole fossil record showing blood, bloodshed, pain, thorns, thistles, disease, cancers, you know, horrible ways to die, recorded for millions of years. You know, what sort of God, a good God, is going to get to the end of that and say, he looked at everything he saw and behold, it was very good. Um, that doesn't go down the track of the God I believe the Bible talks about. And what about Jesus too? He affirmed Genesis as real history. Was he wrong? You know, was he just a good guy who was a man of his times? Why did Jesus have to die a physical death? I've come back to that again. You know, Hebrews 9.12, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. If evolution is true, why did Jesus have to die? What's the gospel all about? What are we being saved from? You know, what's the future um, in Revelation when God recreates you know, new heavens and a new earth? What are we going back to? More bloodshed and evolution? And so you see the whole gospel falls apart. And... Also, the evolution destroys the uniqueness of man. You know, it clearly says in Scripture that we are made in God's image. We're not just an evolved hominid that God happened to infuse a spirit into. You know, we are made uniquely in his image, and we are special. We're not an animal, although we share biological design similarities with that, some animals, but we are different to animals. And so I think our self-worth and our um, view of our identity is so important to understand that God's a creator. He loves us. And he's given us a world to steward as well, to care for, not to worship, but to care for and to um, do our part to share and develop it in a way that honours him. Well, thinking about all these fossils, don't they prove that evolution, that millions of years were needed 
for creatures and that we can show it in the fossils? Well, fossils, of course, are a great uh, tool used to say, well, here I have a fossil, and unfortunately this is in the car at the moment, but, <clears throat> excuse me, fossils, of course, is a, a record of something that died and has become preserved, so a fossil is just a fossil. So that's held up as a fossil must take millions of years to form, so some, imagine I have a fossil here, and so here's great evidence for evolution. See, fossils take a long time to form, the millions of years must be true. But as I pointed out, the same evidence can be used for fossils, can be great evidence for the flood and for rapid burial. And then I went on to have a look at the real world. When we go out there and look at things we can observe, so something, say, dies in the, uh, out in the ocean, um, you know, a whale or a, a fish or whatever, or maybe roadkill or whatever, anything that dies in the open will very quickly be scavenged and just rot away and disappear within a very short time. And so to be preserved as a fossil, a creature has to be buried quickly and thoroughly. And I, I didn't mention it this morning, but uh, one of the other issues for burying large creatures if you have something like a whale or a dinosaur, uh, an elephant, something really big, um, it's a little bit gross, but as things decompose, they start to gas up and they go for a phase where they'll actually float and then they'll sink again as they start to fall apart. So to find you know, whales or elephants or dinosaurs in very, very good condition, bones still all articulated together, something had to smother them completely with huge amounts of sediment, but deep enough to hold down the carcass as it's decomposing in the first stages, otherwise it will break free and float up and then fall apart. And so you're talking about meters, sometimes tens of meters of heavy sediment to hold down a big creature. And we see these huge fossil graveyards that go out, you know, thousands or millions of creatures buried together, all jumbled up, covered over, amazingly well preserved, all sorts of different species. That doesn't happen in any local flood that we ever see today. That amount of uh, uprooting and burying of animals and plants needs a catastrophic event far beyond what we can ever observe. And so the I idea of the present being the key to the past doesn't stack up. The flood was a, a one-off catastrophic event that reshaped the whole earth. And so we can't observe uh, catastrophes or things with that energy occurring today. And so yeah, the Bible's account makes sense when we look at what we see in the fossil record. You've been coming back to Noah's flood a lot, and I just want to ask you, well, how did Noah get so many animals on the ark? Uh, was there enough room for all these species? How could that be possible? And the standard idea we have is that Noah took onto the ark, you know, millions of beetles and, you know, thousands of different species of all sorts of animals and, you know, just, just totally ridiculous. How can you believe that? You know, it may have been a, a reasonably big uh, craft, you know, 150 metres long, that's quite big, but come on, you know, how can you fit in these millions and millions of species? Well, the key thing, again, that scripture always talks about kinds, not species. So as I've emphasised too, that species are a thing that we observe. And so I want to just break down one um, straw man that sometimes is held up against Bible believers. They say, oh, did God create all the species in creation and they stayed the same? No. That's a straw man that's very easy to, to destroy. God created original kinds, and from that, from the diversity included within them, they can then diversify. So when it comes to the flood and the ark, God brought the animals to Noah for a start. So he selected healthy representatives of each kind with a, a rich genetic uh, heritage within them, and he brought them to Noah to care for during the, just over a year on the flood, uh, during the flood in the ark. And so from that, once the um, flood had finished and the creatures went out, they would have started to breed and to diversify, and they would have spread out from that point, uh, also rafting on, on rafts and going across land bridges in the Ice Age, etc. And so from the genetic richness of those original kinds, we then get diversification to the different species. And of course, the ark, on the ark, there weren't fish and dinosaurs, and, sorry, there, there were definitely dinosaurs, there weren't fish um, or any... Uh, you know, certain creatures didn't need to be on the ark, so do you need to take millions of insects on? No, you don't. Uh, a lot of things would have survived outside the um, ark on lo floating log mats, you know, insects and things on rotting carcasses and so on. So a lot of the diversity of things, fish and so on, would have been badly damaged, but would have actually still survived in the flood waters. And so there, it clearly talks about God took uh, air-breathing creatures and birds onto the ark, not species of every type in the, in the, in the world. 
And so we've got a really good uh, resource and many articles on our website on creation.com talking about how, how feasible is Noah's Ark, how do they deal with all the feeding, or the waste materials, um, etc. It's very, very well covered and very plausible as well. So no, they didn't take millions of species on. They, they reckon there would have been about 16,000 individual uh, animals on the ark with an average size of that of about um, a chicken in size, including dinosaurs. Yes, dinosaurs were on the ark, but did they take on a, a 50 ton behemoth? No. God would have just brought in um, small juvenile dinosaurs that were able to come off the ark, sexually mature to be able to breed and to grow from there. Um, an interesting thing about dinosaurs is that they clearly went through a series of growth spurts, putting on huge amounts of weight and size within the years as they, once they got past their teenage uh, growth spurt, I guess, up to the huge ones you saw later. So um, it makes good sense that dinosaurs were on the ark as land animals, but not the big ones. Obviously what we would refer to as dinosaurs, they're mostly extinct. So why do you think that has happened in light of God wanting to preserve creatures? That's a great point, isn't it? Because we know already that the flood would have caused a huge loss of do uh, genetic diversity. So the animals that survived on the ark would have been only a small subset of what was there before the flood. But that's a good point. So dinosaurs, like many other creatures, have become extinct in the years after the flood for a whole range of reasons. You know, environmental damage or changed climate, change, excuse me, changing um, food sources, and of course the impact of man, whether it's hunting or um, deforestation or whatever. And so dinosaurs were just like any other creature that suffered um, pressure. So after the, after the flood you would have found the world was very different. The climate, uh, the ice age occurred after the flood. We would have seen a loss of certain um, animal prey or um, different types of plants, maybe nutritionally were less. And so there would have been a big pressure, especially on large creatures like some of the dinosaurs where their food requirements and so on were bigger than other creatures which maybe were more adaptable. But also the whole thing about the input of mankind. So uh, before 1841, dinosaurs were called dragons. And so there are many, many accounts from cultures all around the world, including here in Aotearoa with the Tanifa and so on. Some of those things obviously were like spiritual beings, but uh, or have a spiritual myth mythological content, but there's also that idea of dinosaur-like creatures all around the world. St. George and the Dragon, you know, was he the, one of the last dinosaur you know, killers? And so on. So you see all these cultural stories of dinosaur-like creatures right up until the last few hundred years around the world in different cultures. And so we believe that the dinosaurs didn't go extinct with the meteor 65 million years ago. Instead, they just basically, by attrition, habitat loss, um, disease, changing environments, impact from hunting and so on, they eventually became extinct. What you're talking about kind of reminds me of the book of Job, where it sort of alludes to these various creatures that we don't really know what they were. So do you think they were dinosaurs? Okay, so yeah, you're talking specifically about Behemoth and Leviathan. So the description seems to be strongly of a dinosaur-like creatures, especially Behemoth. It talks about you know the the greatest uh, creature you know, made by by God. It talks about uh, belly like um, brass and legs like tree trunks and so on. It talks about a, sea, a tail like a cedar tree. So some people try to say, well, that's actually was an elephant or a hippopotamus, but. Elephants and hippo hippopotami have very small tails, like a little string for an elephant or a little flap for a hippopotamus. So the only creature that seems to be uh, to stack up with this idea of a huge tail like a cedar tree would be a sauropod dinosaur, something like a Diplodocus or something. So we don't know for sure whether those creatures were you know, actual um, creatures, but they seem to be, Job is talking about creatures, or, sorry, God was telling uh, Job about creatures he could observe and see. Now what Leviathan was, it's a little more complicated being a sea-dwelling creature, whether it's a, a Chronosaurus or something, we don't know. So, but the imagery and the description of those two creatures does seem to point to real creatures that were formidable, sizable and very, um, very impressive or very awesome to people who would observe them. Yes, I was thinking that might just be interesting for some people to know that mm. the Bible does possibly talk about dinosaurs. But I just want to come back to the Ice Age and the Stone Age. 
I thought you did give some interesting answers mm. this morning, especially about how you know people sort of ending up living in caves might have actually come about. And, well, you explained it well, so I'll let you talk. <laughs> yeah, we had an excellent question there this morning again about the Ice Age. And again, um, I won't go into too much detail here, but saying that the Ice Age would be an expected outcome of the flood, a global flood of the magnitude of the flood of Noah's day, that we'd expect the Ice Age to be a result of that. And we believe, based on evidence, that that would have occurred um, soon after the flood increased to a maximum and then decayed, meaning it lasted for about 700 years, five to 700 years, whatever, of the Ice Age, which again caused huge amounts of change around the world. But not all the world was, um, was frozen up as well. Only about a third of the whole Earth's surface ever uh, was covered with ice during the peak of the Ice Age. And interestingly, a lot of the mid-latitudes were very, very uh, richly vegetated. Um, vegetation, of course, very rapidly spread back around the world again. And um, a lot of those areas were very well watered and moist, you know, with the Sahara Desert, inland Australia, places like that that are now deserts were very lush and rich after the, uh, or during and after the Ice Age because of the greatly increased precipitation. Anyway, so, but of course, after the dispersion of Babel too, when God took the people and they disobeyed him. He said, spread out around the world, uh, be fruitful, multiply, and steward the earth. They said, no, we're going to stay here. We're going to make a tower to, to be like God, you know, reach to the heavens. So God had to judge their uh, belligerence and their disobedience by separating them by language, but I believe also by family lines genetically. So they went off to different places around the world, moved away from Babel, carrying away a subset of their genetics and also a sub subset of the technology that they had. And so you, you would have found small bands of people moving out, not having the technology of their, their community together. So you imagine today something happened in New Zealand where a, cat, a catastrophe happened and we were all suddenly forced out of our homes, had to go and try to survive out in the, in the open. How much of us, how many of us would actually know how to, to go out and to, to make some cement or to smelt iron and make something? We, we wouldn't know, would we? And so often people will go for the easiest way out to survive, you know, to go and live in a cave and to, to you know, make some tools of what's around you. So a lot of what we call the Stone Age was actually really intelligent human beings just making use of what they had based on the circumstances they found themselves in with a loss of technology, a loss of community because of the Babel dispersion. So that's, you know, in some ways a simplistic answer, but there's a lot of evidence that even today people live in caves. You know, caves are great shelter. They provide... Um, you know, comfort and warmth in some places, and so you can actually survive and make a way living in a cave. And if you're nomadic, moving on from place to place, finding shelter like a cave would make good sense. Then, of course, you get the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and so on. So there are broad bands of technology advancing, but the secular idea of the, you know, back like the Flintstones and the Stone Age, those dumb people with clubs and grunting, that's, uh, that's a myth. Right since creation, people have been intelligent, you know, talks in early Genesis about being, making musical instruments, um, forging metal tools and so on. Very early on, people have been clever and have been able to adapt technology. So it's a good question, but have a look on our creation.com website for the Ice Age or Stone Age and uh, get some more answers. In light of Noah's flood, why is it that the Kiwi can only be found in New Zealand? That's a very good question. So I can see where you're coming from. How does the Kiwi get to New Zealand? How did, you know, the kangaroos get to Australia? All these sort of questions. That's a really good point. And that's one of the things that's often used as a, a way of saying, well, you creationists have just got a, you know, a ridiculous story. How did, you know, did a kangaroo hop all the way from Mount Ararat to uh, Australia? Or did the Kiwi sort of swim across or fly across New Zealand and so on? But interestingly, secular um, thinkers as well have a major problem with what we call the biogeographical uh, bio bio distribution of animals around the world. You know, bio being life, geographical being places in the earth. And so we see different creatures all around the world in places they shouldn't be. And it's very difficult to um, understand even in a slow and gradual migration. You know, did, did Kiwis once have wings and flew and then they lost the ability to fly? We're not sure. So there's a lot of things that could have happened. And of course, after the flood, you would have also had lots of vegetation that was buried under huge amounts of sediment, falling coal and so on, but large amounts of floating debris mats would have continued to float for months or years after, many years after the, uh, the flood. And even secularists talk about rafting, you know, creatures getting onto rafts and actually moving 
um, across the world. How do you get tortoises into the Galapagos? How do you get you know, different creatures, snakes, into Pacific Islands? How do they get there? And so the idea of rafting is very uh, plausible. And the flood gives us an ideal account for how things can actually to raft and move around. And of course the Ice Age would have greatly lowered the sea levels, which again is a, a fact everyone would agree on. And while the sea levels were lowered, it opened up land bridges to get across places like into North America and into South America and down into Asia and even Australia. Because Australia only had a, at the lowest point of the Ice Age, uh, sea level lowering. The actual final barrier was only really the size of a, of a deep wide river. Easy enough to swim across or raft across that. So the whole world can actually really be connected to by these low land bridges as well. So how did New Zealand, of course, is out about two and a half thousand k's from Australia, I believe. And so how the Kiwis got to be here is a mystery. Um, there's, there's a possibility they could have flown, we don't know. Okay, so all, all of this really comes down to a debate. Is there a God? Is he the creator? Or are we just a fluke and it just uh, happens by processes which scientists are either have claimed to have discovered and they will come out with different theories and seek to increase their theories. So our aim, of course, having known that God has power and life, we're, we're trying to encourage these unbelievers who don't really want to think about God very often to try and make them think about God. And I know that's a part of your right, ministry. Yes. So how have you been going and and presenting this message to the average person who doesn't want to hear this message. That's a, it's a really important point, isn't it? And so I would make two points of clarification on that. So as Creation Ministries, our primary role is to go to churches. We do church events and we're trying to reach uh, believers, you know, people who love the Lord, to equip them so they then reach out to their family, their friends, their workmates, their neighbours, you know, as, I guess, salt and light in their own communities. So our primary point of contact is uh, believers in the Lord Jesus, you know, people who are already committed Christians, just to equip them to be more effective in how they outreach. So do we actually uh, engage with atheists? Yes, we do. But obviously that's not our prime point. Often they come from a point of view of um, antagonism to behold, uh, towards what we talk about. But there are different ways that i found is useful to, even if you get a, somebody who's very sceptical or uh, scathing of Christianity and creation, is to ask them, oh, you know, so you're a secular humanist, are you? That's, you know, just look, engage with them, uh, understand and respect what their point of view is. So what's, what's been your journey to get to this point? You know, how have you come to this point of being, obviously, you know, you're a very enthusiastic atheist. Tell me about your journey. How, you know, what inputs into your life have you, have you, you know, read or what's brought you to this point of being convinced that atheism is true? And, and also, what's the best evidence you'd use if you were asked to support why you're an atheist? What would you say is your best evidence? And... Often you find that's a way to get talking with them, not saying you're wrong and I'm right or whatever. If you start to go down the track of trying to defend yourself, it sometimes it's not as fruitful as actually engaging with them and respectfully asking them to explain what they mean. So I think for both of us, atheists or Christians or whatever, it's knowing what we believe and why. And most people don't really know why they believe certain things. They just, well, that's the way it is. Um, I've always believed that. Um, yeah, they don't really know. So I really encourage, if you're watching this or you know people who are struggling, just get alongside them and just try to tease out what they believe about the world, what they believe about where they came from, uh, why they're here and where they're going. And sometimes the um, examination of those questions is quite difficult. People feel struggle with, oh, it's too hard, I don't want to think about it. But we do, do need to think about where we're going in life, what we believe, what we do and what we're going to do with it. So. Um, I think that's the best way is to lovingly question people and then when the questions come up you can then share evidence you have about why you believe what you do and why the Bible makes sense. Um, so that's a good way to engage with atheists or non-believers or even people who have been maybe touched by uh, a Christian background or some sort of religious experience but have gone off God or they've been hurt by the church or hypocrisy or doubt or you know, what they perceive as unanswered prayer or something has hurt them and pushed them away from God. And so by lovingly understanding where they're coming from, why they're hurting, or why they're disillusioned, or why they're unbelieving, often you can have a way to lovingly just give them things to think about. We talk about putting a, a stone in someone's shoe. Once they've heard what you, you say something, they can't unhear what you said. 
So by lovingly uh, asking God to give you words to seed into people's minds, you can hopefully get them thinking about, hmm, maybe, yeah, what did he say about this? You know, get them thinking. And so we, we're called to pull down strongholds in every lofty thought. And sometimes people have this intellectual barrier but, um, holding them back from coming to God. And we can just help to dismantle, take a few bricks out and help to get them thinking outside the square. So a main way that you're seeking to train and equip Christians to have answers to share with their friends or unbelieving neighbours is things like your website and your creation magazine and you've got so many different books and, and materials so let's give people ideas and why they should contact your ministry and why churches or pastors should in, invite you to come and share at their church to to release this kind of material through their people and just spread this message. Yeah, thanks Matthew. Yeah, so as a creation ministry is where, you know, basically non-denominational, non-political, we're donation funded, but we do sell quite a number of resources. It's not our main income stream, but our reason for producing uh, all these sort of resources and many many of them are free off our website so I really encourage you first of all to equip yourself by going to creation.com and you'll find there's a, a search engine with about 13,000 articles you can download you can read there's uh, YouTube channels there's podcasts there's video clips PDF files heaps of resources for you to equip yourself all for free and then of course we've got our flagship magazine which is called creation magazine and that's a really powerful tool to be able to subscribe to give to your family and friends, put it on the coffee table at work or whatever. And you also get a range of digital um, subscriptions with that come bundled into the price. And so that's a great way to reach out, to give people resources that are interesting and will get them engaged. And then of course we've got more technical resources or children's resources, uh, video, uh, books, tracks, pamphlets, all sorts of things to hopefully give people tools to read and to feed themselves and to pass on. So we have this concept called linking and feeding. By linking yourself with the ministry and God's word, you then get tools that you can then pass on. So you link, you feed yourself, and then you link with somebody else and pass it on. So Creation Magazine is a great way to read, pass it on. And the website, read, and link it and share it on Facebook or whatever. So by, as you get equipped, you can share those resources with others and help them as well. We're starting to cover a lot. I don't know if there's anything specific you else you have to say, just to encourage people to actually believe in God. Yes, I really want to emphasise again that you know we live in a very face, uh, very fast-paced world, and you know a lot of things go on. People get very distracted with social media and, and, and entertainment and life generally, the pressures of life. But ultimately, though, we're only here for a, you know, a limited number of years, and so what's the whole thing about eternity is there's something beyond this life. So I would really encourage you whether you're a you know, full-on believer in Jesus or whether you're somebody who's on the journey or whether you maybe happen to see this and you're a, you know, somebody who's very anti-God, you know, I'm an atheist or whatever and I think this God idea, this myth is a bunch of um, myths and you know, imaginary friends and you know, believing dusty old books. Wherever you are on that line between uh, you know, full-on atheism to fully engage with God, I really encourage you just to think about the big picture. You know, where are you going? Why are you here? What's life all about? Um, you know, is there really something beyond this life? Is there something I should be focusing my life on now? Um, or is it just about eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow I'm dead? So really, it seems a bit harsh, but just think about the big picture. What you're here for, where you're going. If there's a God, what's your God picture? Who, who is God to you? Is he some angry old guy with a beard and a big stick whacking you and firing lightning bolts down? Or is he a loving father who's given you free will, but is also holding you accountable too to live your life in a way that honours him and uh, respects other people. So there's certain things that we need to really take on board about our worldview. So I encourage you, just um, have a think about it. Think about those big questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? See what answers you come up with. Maybe write them down. And um, But again, pray. You know, just reach out to God and say, God, if you're real... Reveal yourself to me, and he will hear that cry. So many testimonies of people who have actually had an open heart come to a, a line in the sand in their life and go, Maybe this, this God thing is real. And by asking him, he'll come to you and, and meet with you. And also, the last three questions you could rephrase as instead of, Why am I sorry, where did I come from? Why am I here, and where am I going? could be, 
Where did I come from? Why is the world in the state it's in? And what's the solution? So try answering those three questions as well, because that will give you an idea of what your worldview is, how you answer those three questions. Where did I come from? Why is the world in the state it's in? And what's the solution? I believe that, you know, I came from, I'm created in God's image. The world is in the state it's in because it's fallen, because of Adam and Eve's sin, and our sin over all those millennia. And the solution is Jesus and the gospel being lived out by authentic Christians. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. I'm sure it's given us and those listening food for thought. Mm. And I'd just like to get you just, if you'd like to pray for those who have been listening, might be a variety of different people, and you can just speak a blessing for them and and just the hand of God to touch them. Mm. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, I'd like to pray, and I'm going to pray with my eyes open because I just want to... Just be, we're, just talking, we're just talking to Jesus, aren't we? We, just, uh, we have a Heavenly Father, He loves us. So Father, I just thank you for this opportunity just to be able to share with Matthew, with his church, and uh, Lord, with anyone watching this too, that Lord, as you continue to touch them and minister to them, I speak blessing upon them. May they just come to a point of really understanding again that you love them. You know, you've created them for a purpose. They are precious in your sight. And Lord, as they continue to unravel what this whole thing is about life, that Lord, you will reveal yourself to them, that they'll have no doubt in their heart that they are made in your image, they're precious to you, and Lord, you'll use them to live for you, bless other people, and to have a life of, of fulfilment. And of course, that, that hope as well, Lord, as we just go to be with you in the future, know that you know, we'll be in the arms of a loving Saviour. So Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I uh, thank you for um, modern technology and for the tools we have to reach out and to touch other people. In Jesus' name.